All right, I am here with fisheries biologist Max Walters today. Um, you guys chimed in with a whole bunch of questions this morning uh, you have concerning a uh, bunch of lakes that here in the Hayward area, and we're going to get right into it and ask away. Um, I gave Max about 10 seconds to look at these, <laughs> so he probably doesn't have much of a response prepared yet. Um, why, why do walleye numbers, Andrew Gullick, Gullickson asks, why do walleye numbers seem to be down in Wisconsin lakes with clear water? Okay, well first I gotta say hi to Andrew, because yep. he's a friend of mine up, going Andrew? way back. Um, why do walleye numbers seem to be down, particularly in clear lakes? Walleye are a species that actually benefits from darker water, and that doesn't mean dirty water, polluted mm -hmm. water but they benefit from river systems that can be a little bit more turbid. So we've seen walleye continue to do better in places like the Chippewa Flowage that have more of that stain or that turbidity. Places like Cooter Ray, um, some of the other clear water lakes in the area, yeah, we're having a little bit more issues. Um, habitat changes can come into the mix there and can impact how well they're doing, especially on the reproduction side, yeah. it seems to be we're seeing. How is that like uh, something that's specific to the way you guys study walleyes, you think, or just purely because I would think it would be the other way around. I'd think walleyes would do way better on a lake like Grindstone or Cooter Ray than yeah. a lake like the flowage. Just well, yeah. Um, forage and that's just the way it makes sense. Forage is one part of the equation. The other part is, you know, walleye are a visual predator. They like those dim low light conditions. Mm -hmm. So in a dark lake like the Chippewa Flowage, you get a lot more of that low light feel yeah. for the fish. Mm -hmm. um, whereas especially our shallow clear lakes and, and even Nelson Lake's a good example. Yeah. That lake cleared up a lot and walleye started having problems. So um, they do better with dark water or really deep water. Okay. And so that's why they're still doing okay in, mm -hmm. in some of those that's clear lakes. interesting, because I would yeah. have guessed it would be exactly the opposite. Um, okay, so Clint Williams asks, what determines what musky strains they allow in different Wisconsin lakes? I'm assuming he's talking about stocking. I, I assume so too. Um, yeah, so our stocking policy is all built around what the native genetics are for that area. So here we're in the upper Chippewa Basin, so we stock muskies of upper Chippewa origin. So our brood lakes are Lacoudere, the Chippewa Flowage, and Teal and Lost Land Lakes. Over in the northeast part of the state, they're in the upper Wisconsin River, so they're using fish from the upper Wisconsin River. When you get outside of the two native drainages that we have for muskies in mm -hmm. Wisconsin, um, then we have lakes where they're open to any type of stocking. Uh, so that's where they have brought in, you know, leech lake fish or fish from private hatcheries and put them into Lake Minota or Mendota. Yeah. Um, so, so an area like, um, like Bone Lake, Luck, Wisconsin, where they have actually stocked Minnesota fish. Yeah, and there, there, are, are, th there are a few places around here where they have done the leech lake yeah. fish, and typically those are outside of the true historic okay. Chippewa drainage for the native muskies. And is there any reason to that, or is it just that's kind of the way... It, they just oh, don't want yeah. two different fish well, button heads or yeah, I mean if you have a native population of fish you want to go with that because those are the genetics that are adapted for mm -hmm. that environment. Um, and every conservation geneticist in the country will tell you that same thing. If you don't have something and you're you're starting from scratch with a musky population, then you'd want to look for the genetics that best match your environment. Um, but you do have more options on the table there. Um, we can't get into this too much, but when yeah. I worked in <laughs> Illinois, um, <laughs> We stocked all kinds of stuff down there because there was no native genetics. So yeah. we tried everything and mm -hmm. it was an interesting project. All right. Well, that is interesting to hear. What else do we have? Anthony Abate? We'll go with that. How does an abnormally cold season and water temps affect musky behavior and spawning success? That's just as much of a fishing question as it is a <laughs> biology question, but. Um, Go ahead with the biology part. Yeah, so yeah, I'll let you try and handle the fishing part. If I knew how to answer the fishing <laughs> part of it, I'd probably be a pro muskie angler, but I'm definitely not. Uh, on the biology side of things, when you have a cold spring, or what we had this year, which was a lot of temperature fluctuation, yeah, mm -hmm. the spawn's on, then it's off, and it's on, then it's off, and it really gets drawn out. Um, you can see situations where females will start to reabsorb some of their eggs if they just don't like the conditions they're experiencing. So mm -hmm. it's very possible with a kind of erratic spring yeah. like we had that we will see lower recruitment numbers for some species. Okay, yeah, that make, obviously makes sense. Um, from the fishing standpoint, what you typically see on a lake um, with a cooler summer, um, you can go back a handful of years and look at the flowage uh, where you have a lake where so many guys fish the exact same way. Um, you know, like if you have a year with a cool summer, typically you're gonna see a lot of big fish get caught. And that's primarily because these guys are fishing shallow, these fish aren't pulling off, going deeper off structure. Um, as much as they would on a summer where things get real hot. Now that doesn't necessarily mean if you know your water temp peaks at like a 71 or a 72 um, in the summer, which would be a real cool summer, 
that fish aren't going to be used in the basin, um, you know, open water areas, but they might not be down as far. Um, so these fish are a lot more apt to slide up on structure, typically on most bodies of water, um, if you have those sustained cool water temps without, you know, temps jumping up to like 77, 78, or even 80 degrees during the summer. Just from what I've seen uh, for musky fish in this area. Hmm. Um, so Mark Elliott says, I heard that panfish particular crappie did not spawn this year and probably were not going to. I can attest to that because crappie that were caught Labor Day, I'm sure he's talking about Memorial Weekend, right? Okay. I always mix those two up too. So we'll go with Memorial Weekend. Um, still had eggs. What impact is that going to have on the crappie population for years to come? Yeah. So obviously there's going to be less crappies because if crappies didn't spawn, hypothetically. That's just math, I think. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, is less crappies good for more larger crappies? I guess that would kind of be what this boils down to. Yeah. I don't think so. Now, there's a lot going on there, and, and, and that person's hit on an interesting pattern, mm -hmm. especially with crappies. They'll go years before they pull off a big year class, and then boom, all of a sudden you get right. one huge year class, and you'll see those work through a population sometimes. The flowage has been relatively consistent, but yeah, you alluded to this. It's a little counterintuitive, but you actually don't want a ton of panfish recruitment where they're filling the lake with lots and lots and lots of little ones mm -hmm. because then they're all competing for the same food and growing slowly, and that's actually what looks like a, a stunted population as a lot of people yeah. refer to it. So a lower amount of recruitment is... Not necessarily a bad thing. Not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you in know, a lake that has a ton of crappies in it already, right. essentially. Yeah, so, but this year was one where we did see a lot of those females reabsorbing their eggs and yeah. just they didn't like the conditions they had. Mm -hmm. um, so they passed on it and they'll try again next year and that's very common for crappies. Yeah, especially on a body of water like the flowage, you see it a lot where um, you'll have bays because that whole lake's not stagnant ever. I mean, it's there's pockets of water, warm water here, kind of depending on the wind is, how stuff's cooling down and warming up. But, uh, you know, I mean, you might have an insane crappie bite in a foot of water for two weeks in the north end. And at the south end, you know, it seems like you have fish pulling and slide out in a day. Yeah. You know, it just all kind of depends on, you know, how stuff shifts around, what's warming up, what's cooling down, stuff like that. Um, Mark, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this. So, S-J-O-B-O-L-M. -B -O -L -M. Um, why is there no limit on largemouth bass on the flowage? That's, assume he's talking about the chip of flowage. Yeah. Um, which is interesting because everybody I talk to is seriously bass fishes for largemouth, which I don't really do that. Um, it sounds like there's a downward trend in overall numbers of big largemouth. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know if you guys see the same thing or if that was male. We did see, yeah, so I'll start by just answering the question, yeah. why is there no limit on, on largemouth on the Chippewa Flowage? When we were getting into the period of around 2010, 2011, we were starting to see a lot more largemouth than we'd seen in the flowage historically, mm -hmm. and the size was not great. There were some over 14 inches, but we had a lot of them stacking up between 11 and 13 inches. Yeah. So the good management there is to take the length limit off, allow people to harvest some more of those smaller ones, so hopefully mm -hmm. we can speed up the growth and get more big ones. And yeah. we're not picking on bass. This isn't like something yeah, that no, we just invented to be mean to bass. We do yeah. the same thing with walleye mm -hmm. um, when they get a little bit too dense and aren't growing very slowly. So we took that off, and in our surveys, we've actually seen an increase in the percentage of bass that are over 14 inches. So the size structure's good. gotten better. Yeah. The abundance is a little bit lower than it was about five to 10 years yeah. ago. And a lot of that has to do with the fluctuating water levels that have come mm -hmm. back. Now that we're in a wetter cycle, uh, there's more drawdowns on the chip of flowage. That's just kind of a fact of life yeah. on a flowage. Exactly. It exists to hold and store mm -hmm. water. So, um, But we're starting to see the bass population creep back up, and hopefully anglers are noticing that yeah. too. Yeah, and I see a lot of people keeping largemouth. Um, you know, obviously what would probably be best is if these guys were keeping 12-inch fish, right? Yep. I mean, Target you don't want people coming ones. in yeah. with... 16, 17, 18 inch right. largemouth, obviously, which goes for a lot of the you know species. Exactly. Yeah. Fish. If you know, if we could, we'd put a slot limit on there that would protect those mm -hmm. bigger ones. The issue there is it would put out tournaments because then they exactly, couldn't do their yeah. things. So we're kind of trying to walk the line between yep. a bunch of competing interests here. But you're exactly right. Harvest those mm -hmm. smaller ones. Let the big ones go. Yep. All right. What else do we have? Um, this is a question I get a lot. And fishing Grindstone Lake. Um, a fair amount. Uh, it's always something that I think about. Um, why is the walleye slot the way it is out there? So it's a uh, three fish limit. Um, you can only have one over 18, nothing between 14 and 18. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Um, this answer might kind of sound bureaucratic and in, in a way it yeah. is, but you know, that regulation was put on and we wanted to let it run out for a period of time so we could evaluate it and see what it 
if it was successful at improving the size of walleye mm -hmm. out there in Grindstone and also continuing to main, maintain good recruitment. Um, it arguably has been effective at both of those, maybe not a runaway success, but yeah. uh, we have a good walleye population in Grindstone. Absolutely. Whether we continue to have that same regulation going into the future or not kind of remains to be seen. Um, yeah. But, you know, oh, yeah, we have it for now as a part of a statewide yeah. evaluation. There's a bunch of lakes that got mm -hmm. that, including Lake Wasota down in Chippewa County is another one. And it can't so. just be a one-year go out and throw it on and pull it off. Yeah, it works. yeah exactly. So you got to give it some time. There's got to be a length of time. All right, here we have a good one about panfish. Why are we putting 10 panfish limits on lakes that have only seasonal fishing pressure uh, or winter fishing, as uh, Jared wrote? Um, a 10 panfish limit on Nelson Lake has only made the panfishing on Nelson a stunted lake. Okay. Um, well, I guess, I don't know if How long have they been in effect, I guess? Well, the, the, the 10 panfish limit on Nelson, I believe, has been in effect since the late 90s. Okay. And that, will, that population looked very different at the time that that was put mm -hmm. into effect. I would also maybe disagree with the fact that that's just a lake that's fished through the ice. There's a lot of summer yeah. fishing pressure out there as well. Um, we look at lakes for those reduced bag limits that have good growth. And at the time it was put on Nelson, it did have really good growth. There was a lot of walleye out there. The panfish population was really thin. Mm -hmm. And it used to grow one pound bluegills pretty routinely. That's what I've heard. Had the state record <laughs> yeah. for a while. That's crazy. Um, the issues on Nelson right now aren't really related to the bag limit. They're related to what's changed out there with the predators. We have uh, so many more panfish now. We're splitting that food a bunch of different ways and they're not growing as quickly. So mm -hmm. the 10 bags, not necessarily a bad idea now, but it, it, it's not functioning the same way as it did when everything in this fishery was in balance. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I get that. So a lake that, yeah, and you can't really, there's, it's hard to, uh, I mean, a lake that gets fished in the winter versus a lake that gets fished in the summer, I mean, you could argue that's like a decent amount of fishing pressure throughout the season. Yeah, you know, right. Because, yeah. you know, there's a handful of lakes like that in our county and all across the state, obviously, smaller lakes that get pounded in the winter, mm -hmm. no boats on them in the summer. Right. Um, so it's uh, or vice versa in yeah, some exactly. cases. So, so yeah, I mean, pressure is pressure. I guess for me, it doesn't really matter when it's happening. Um, when you got people harvesting a lot of panfish, it can really knock the size structure down. Mm -hmm. Reducing a bag limit is one tool to try and keep the size from declining, yeah. basically. Yeah, and I've always thought big bluegills, especially, they're probably one of the most unique resources available. They are. And once they're gone, it's like they're yeah. gone. And they're yeah. so susceptible, especially in yeah, a clearer exactly. lake where they're going to sit mm -hmm. on a bed and you can kind of Drive around go around, around and pick off which ones you want. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a tool. It's it's not one everybody agrees with. We want to find the appropriate places to use it. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we have to have everything else working in that fishery, too, as oh, far absolutely. as the predator yeah. balance. It's not a cure-all. No, thing, definitely so. not. Yeah. Cool. All right, so one last question here. Uh, no one asked it, but it's kind of something that goes... Um, almost flies under the radar if you do a ton of fishing, but you know if it's your first time coming up here, or you're just looking to, you know, target lakes that are more geared towards your shot at a, a really big muskie versus your shot at lots of numbers of muskies. Um, you know, how do you, how do you look at a lake, you know, on paper, or just pick out a lake up here in general, you know, for basically to fit what you want to do versus having a ton of action or going out and targeting you know a big fish in that 45 and up inch class. Sure. Yeah. Um... You know, we have a lot of lakes that are, are some of our smaller musky lakes that would definitely fall into that action group, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, Spider, Mud Callahan, um, got a bunch down in the winter area, yeah. Barber, Black Dan, East Fork Lakes, like mm -hmm. Blaisdell. Um, those are high density musky populations. The fish are small there because there's a lot of muskies, so there's a lot of competition for food, and it's also, you know, a reflection of what the forage base is. Yeah. In a small lake, you might have perch, bluegill, crappies, maybe small a few crappies, suckers. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, they don't have a lot of those big prey items to, yeah. to move up to. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go for that trophy sized fish, you got to look for the places that have the potential to grow them. You got to look at what the forage base is. So lakes that have a good population of those big suckers. Yep. Lakes that have Cisco, of course. Yep. Excellent. And those lakes that come to mind are deep clear natural lakes. Yeah, in a lot there. of cases, yeah. And you will get some big muskies in some of the river systems too, because yep. there's a lot of suckers and red horse there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, big muskies don't get big by accident. They don't yeah. get big by eating four eating inch bluegills. bluegills. They yeah. want something big. Um, and only a few of our lakes in this area can support that. Really fit that, yeah. yeah. But you look at, you know, the muskie fishing world yep. and the places that are growing big fish, whether it's, you know, Green Bay or Mm -hmm. Vermilion or Lake of the Woods, whatever. Yeah. Big water, big forage base, and that's that's yeah. the formula. It's really pretty simple. Yeah, it is, and really, 
the neat part about the Hayward area is you have these lakes that are have a lot of big fish potential. You know, mm -hmm. they have these big suckers. Um, you know, Cisco's big bodied Cisco's. Um, and, and, but then five minutes away, you have a lake that's it's all numbers. These fish are feeding you know in the weeds a lot of the year, just off structure a lot of the year um, on crappies, perch, and bluegills. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I wouldn't say there's one lake that makes Hayward just an awesome musky destination. It really is collectively. Um, as a whole, looking at it and uh, you know seeing what you can do in a day driving 10 minutes each direction that makes Hayward really unique in my opinion. Yeah, it's just a great diversity of opportunities mm -hmm. and the clear lakes, dark lakes, you got some fantastic rivers yep. in this area that I think get overlooked a lot. Oh, absolutely. Great I've never, musky fishing I've never rivers. Fished a river. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean whether it's the Chippewa, Namakagan, Flambeau, yeah. those all have really good musky populations that, that just don't get fished as much and mm -hmm. I think those fish might be a little more aggressive because of it. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys got a lot of your questions answered. Um, make sure to comment below on this YouTube video uh, more questions you might have. I don't know if you have anything you want to add. No, send some more questions. We'll come back and do it again. Yeah, more questions. Um, I like doing these. I hope you guys like watching them, so stay tuned for more in the future. What is up, guys? I hope you liked today's vlog. If you haven't already, make sure to check out this video, this video, and this video, and absolutely subscribe to this channel.